So this is a video entitled Preferred Frame Exists According to J May J J J. Uh, he's here on Wikipedia. He is a Portuguese cosmologist and professor in theoretical physics at Imperial College London. He's a pioneer of a theory about varying at the speed of light. Go on. So here he is in a talk and he's what he's gonna say is a preferred frame exists. So we just listen to that bit for a minute. Just for the sake of the, this conference. Okay, so having put things in context here, I'm going to be really, really quick. I was, we were also asked to be quick and to the point. You were not. You're the worst one, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to be very, very fast about what actually is assumed here. So how do you break all these things? Okay, first of all, if you ask about what, are there any frames in the universe? What kind of special frames in the universe are there? Indeed, there is a special one. A quote from a Portuguese philosopher now, I suppose. So the special one here is the cosmological frame. There is actually a preferred frame in the universe. Okay? Cosmo frame. And sometimes people, you know, put up this smoke screen. No, that's not true. You know, blah, 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 because the universe is not exactly homogeneous. Well, to zero order it is. And early on there is. And once there is to zero order and earlier on, even the fluctuations, you can pick a gauge. So the smoke screen that in detail the cosmological frame doesn't exist, I think, is just misconceived. There is, as far as the universe is concerned, as far as the matter in the universe is concerned, there is indeed a preferred frame. And it's the cosmological frame, the frame where the universe looks on average homogeneous. Nowadays, you just have to look at the microwave background, not the galaxies. It's easier to look at the microwave background. And you get your preferred frame. Okay, so there is a preferred frame, so this is the first thing. I'm going to be pretty schematic and quick. Second point is that once there is a preferred frame, I think it would be perverse to think that this frame does not partake in the formulation of the laws of physics. So, perverse that it does not partake in the formulation of the laws. So I don't apologize, there's nothing deep here, I'm not being deep at all. So, it, there's, that's the relevant bit, he's saying that there is a preferred frame. So, the steps are as follows. Geo Major says there's a preferred frame, says it exists, and those who say don't, don't exist are throwing up a spoke screen. And it was at that video lecture highlighted there where he says that. Now, unfortunately, we really need to look at the context of what he's saying. Uh, when he says that and, and it does change things a little bit when we look at the context but just taking it as face value that a preferred frame exists we go on now to the next point, point two right, a fact by this omission that some relativists saying preferred frame does not exist means they don't understand things properly and are bad relative tests. So basically you've got people out there who claim to believe in Einstein's relativity and they're saying there's no preferred frame. And so we've got to just take that to mean that they are bad relative tests because it actually does exist, there is a preferred frame. Okay, so we're moving on now to point three. Now, given a preferred frame, 
uh, the time in that frame is absolute as per Newton then clocks not going by the absolute time of this preferred frame have the wrong time. There is no different time for different frames. Either you have time as per the preferred frame or you have the wrong time on your clock. And so that is the influence of the preferred frame. If you have a preferred frame, you then have a preferred time, which Newton would probably call an absolute time and that's the way it is there, there are of course different types of preferred frames you could have and Joe Mejo is only giving one type of preferred frame you could actually have for which you could put your clock from so what we're having now from step 3 is you have a return of Newton's absolute time Right, now step four. This disposes of Einstein's insight that time is different for different observers because we now have an absolute time by step three. Step five. We thus have Newtonian physics and all this wordplay by relativists to create word salad. That is me mess messing up their words when they say things like there's no preferred frame. And the fudge fact is added to the maths to create maths maths fudge just when they do their maths they're making a fudge of things just means that their relativity is messed up Newtonian physics so that's quite a lot to go through we have we're having to accept that certain relativists are bad relativists they are bad they are saying there's no preferred frame when there really is a preferred frame and when we have a preferred frame we can form an absolute time why, which is what Newton wanted and so all these bad relativists when they've played around with all their words which is word salad and when they've played around all their maths their fudge factors they've just really made a mess of what is Newtonian physics right uh, given this that uh, all that's happened is they've messed up Newtonian physics, then there is no problem with adding relativity to quantum mechanics. Einstein's relativity just merely needs spinning as a mess. Step 7, Einstein wrong QED. So basically, if we return back to Newtonian physics, there's no problem with dealing with Newtonian physics uh, combined with quantum mechanics, which I've gone into in other videos. And so this is also a problem of Einstein's uh, relativity combined with quantum mechanics that just all disappears and that's all just from accepting there's a preferred frame and accepting the consequences of that preferred frame as meaning a return to Newtonian physics and I added extra information here if we look at Einstein's work on special relativity he supposedly proposes only two ideas first idea is the principle of relativity and the second idea is constancy of light speed and the constancy of light speed is probably meaning in the context of inertial frames and when it's a vacuum and other things like that but that sort of thing starts getting a bit strange precisely what does he mean by that and Einstein adds to, adds to this his crazy idea of time different for different observers we can ask where does this third idea come from we get no answer it just added without making sense and violate, violates what we know about preferred frame etc modern physics then spends 100 plus years on his craziness so just from the admission of uh, there is a preferred frame we are then back to there is a preferred frame, we are then back to Newtonian physics. So this is highlighted uh, in his talk when, when a member of the audience asks him a question. And we'll go on to that now. So a person is going to ask him a question and it's all going to get ha 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 ha. What you're talking about, what he's talking about is a return to Newtonian physics. Well, radical in some way distant, I mean 
disrespect it if it... I also call it naive in the end, right? Naive, maybe, but... I don't, I don't, in a certain sense, it's not radical at all. It's the opposite. It, um, pardon me for saying, but in some sense it's reactionary because you want to go back... <laughs> You want, to go, you want to go back to a notion of space-time that preceded the 20th century, and it wants to yes, ignore that's right. the essential lessons of, about space-time that the 20th century has taught us. So it's nouveau and I don't, Newtonian. Nouveau, you know. yeah. <laughs> neo, Neo-Newtonian, <laughs> as in, as in neo-liberal. Okay. So they're all laughing. What's being proposed is a return to Newtonian physics. So they're laughing, because that means... They spent more than a hundred years going in the wrong direction, if that was true. And I just want to say what I think the essential issue is, what the essential lesson of the 20th century is. It's not whether there's a distinguished frame or there's not a distinguished frame. It's the causal structure of space-time. It's the fact that we don't, you know, that causes operate within the light cone and the causal order, if you like, the temporal order of space-time is in the nature of a partial order and not a linear order, but I think which is Newtonian. And you're throwing that out. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, you can throw it out. Well, but one but thing I'm doing... But one thing I'm I think is, we should... But one thing I'm doing is making it more flexible, because I'm making the light cones less rigid. And in particular here, you might say, I like that so much, I make two copies of it. <laughs> That's actually what biometric theory does. <laughs> I like Lorenzian... So... They, they've gone off on to diversion. They're laughing that you bring it back to the preferred frame and it would be bringing it back to Newtonian physics. But we go back to that person. However you want to do it. And there's a solution. Not that person. That's very important. I suppose it's not what black is. And I think that's more important. But I think for the sake of the century, has taught us. So it's that's and the I know. You go back to that person. He, do, he wants to ignore the problem that they've, uh, of the preferred frame and he wants to go off on a tangent and consider something else. So basically, that's how they get, tie themselves up into knots. So basically the structure of... Uh, the structure has been, he's saying there's a preferred frame and if we're going back to the preferred frame, then there have been relativists that have been saying that there's no preferred frame and therefore they must be bad relativists. And if you've got a preferred frame, then you are back to Newtonian physics. And he wants to laugh about that. But it means that more than 100 years they have been on the wrong track. So that's basically it. But unfortunately it gets more complicated because we have to look at the context of what uh, Jaya has to say about preferred frame. What well, what he has to say about preferred frame was it when he gets to it. If we go here, what I want to do now is go to the start of the talk. And this gives the context of what he's talking about, which leads him to saying there is a preferred frame. And when you look at the context, it's not so clear whether he's being serious or not about advocating a preferred frame. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, so we were asked to be provocateurs by the organizers, uh, which I guess means two tasks. First one is to, to be provocative, I guess, but then um, you were also asked to listen, to be open-minded and listen. So he, he was asked to be pro pro provocative in this talk. So by saying there's a preferred frame, is, be, is he being provocative? Listen people and be ready to change. I'm afraid that with a couple of exceptions I haven't seen much of that here. I think most people are just entrenching themselves in their work, the lines of research, and um, that's okay. But uh, for a change, 
I'm actually going to stand up here and defend something I don't believe in. So, so he's going to talk about something he doesn't believe in. And so it's coming like he's going to say there's a preferred frame exists, but he's talking about all of this in a context of something he doesn't believe in, which is making it all the more ambiguous. Everything I'm about to say, I don't believe in it. Um, but you know, that's okay. First of all, I don't think belief should be part of this. It's not religion, this is science. Uh, so ultimately, uh, without being Popperian or whatever, I hope that we can actually let experiment take the final word. And what I'm about to say, certainly we'll let experiment take the final word. And second, regardless of my beliefs or your beliefs or your research projects or whatever, um, what I'm about to say remains a distinct possibility, which will really inform a lot this discussion about time, about whether time is... So even though he's saying he's not believing what he's going to say, he's saying this is a possibility. So he's offering what seems to be speculation. So he's not putting himself completely out on agreeing with everything which he's going to say. He's, he's, he's not making a definite commitment. Fundamental or not, and connects that with something very important, which is where the universe came from. Okay? So the thing I'm about to envisage here, which is quite strong, is that there is not soft, not spontaneous, but heartbreaking of just about everything. Okay? What I mean here is really things like local or empty variance, and if you morphism invariance, take your favorite symmetry and break it. And particularly for the purpose of this, um, this meeting, one thing I will question is time translation invariance, okay? And which this relates directly to what Lee said. You know, basically, the question is not so much whether there is time or there isn't time, it's a revolution in the laws of physics. And what happens to time and our perception of time if this is the case. So first of all, why don't I believe in it? Just to contextualize this a little bit better. So this is obviously, so there is radical conservative, or conservative radical, whatever. Well, this is radical radical, okay? And this is quite extreme. And um, I don't need to do this, but I will um, basically discuss this just to kind of, for, to, to make, make things more concrete within the context of a varying speed of light. So very important, if you are very brutal about the way you consider a varying speed of light, well, A, things, horrible things may happen, like you can kill your grandmother before you were born and so on. We don't want that, okay? Um, so we can be very brutal, but this actually happens. You don't need to. So that's a very important point here. So basically what he's talking about is this variable speed of light. Is it, that's his personal theory he's trying to advocate. So... It's not really what we're interested in. We're interested in the bit. Well, it's really, if you accept an existence of preferred frame, consequences of all that is your absolute time and you're back to Newtonian physics. But he's not really wanting to do that. He's wanting to propose a different theory. There's other ways to do these, like biometric theories and something called the form special relativity that have a varying speed of light without actually breaking everything you can think of. And I'm going to break everything you can think of here. And I'm not saying I believe in it. And the reason is the following. I think we are cosmologists, some of us. But the guy there is a cosmologist. You're going to hate me for what I'm about to say. Don't look behind. <laughs> and basically, we were told that we have to solve these two things, these kind of things called the cosmological problems. And a lot of this discussion here, in a way, is framed within this context. We have to solve cosmological problems. And I'd like to divide them into two types. There's Mark I, which is essentially what was proposed initially in the 80s. Things like the flatness problem, the entropy problem, the homogeneity problem, etc. That's really a bunch of fine-tuning issues with the Big Bang, which basically were behind discussion of things like inflation. Nowadays, I mean, there's what I call Mark II problems, which is the universe is not homogeneous. It has fluctuations, and we know them very carefully now. In fact, we know that their amplitude is on the order of 10 to the minus 5. The spectral index is 0 0.96. 
and numbers being added on every day or every year or every few years. So I'm going to argue here, before I continue, that these problems are problems invented and solved by people who've never done a day's work in their life. Okay? And I'm quoting from a British philosopher you might know at this point. Whereas I think this is a problem for the working classes, okay? And I regard myself as a working class cosmologist. So this is really what should be addressed, and in particular, Niayashi is laughing because actually we have a way of doing this quite carefully, which is more predictive, uh, more falsifiable, therefore, than inflation. And this is why I actually don't believe in what I'm about to say, which is be aristocratic for the rest of this talk, talk about these problems, and specifically talk about this, this particular approach. Okay, so radical, radical, just for the sake of the, this conference. Okay, so having put things in context here, I'm going to be really, really quick. I was, we were also asked to be quick and to the point. You were not. You were the worst one, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to be very, very fast about what actually is assumed here. So how do you break all these things? Okay, first of all, if you ask about what, are there any frames in the universe, what kind of special frames in the universe are there, indeed there is a special one quote from a Portuguese philosopher now, I suppose. So the special one here is the cosmological frame. There is actually a preferred frame in the universe. So there we go. We got to the bit where he's saying there is a preferred frame. And he's uh, done all his sort of hand-waving about he's not telling you something that he believes in when he gets to this stage of saying there's a preferred frame. But when you look at it properly, a preferred frame solves everything gets you back to Newtonian physics. Okay. Cosmo frame. And sometimes people, you know, put up this smoke screen, oh that's not true, you know, blah blah blah, because the universe is not exactly homogeneous. Well to zero order it is, and earlier on there is. And once there is to zero order and earlier on, even the fluctuations you can pick a gauge. So the smoke screen that in detail the cosmological frame doesn't exist, I think, is just misconceived. There is, as far as the universe is concerned, as far as the matter in the universe is concerned, there is indeed a preferred frame, and it's the cosmological frame, the frame where the universe looks on average homogeneous. Nowadays, you just have to look at the microwave background, not the galaxies. It's easier to look at the microwave background, and you have your preferred frame. Okay, so there is a preferred frame, so this is the first thing. I'm going to be pretty schematic and quick. Second point is that once there is a preferred frame, I think it would be perverse to think that this frame does not partake in the formulation of laws of physics. So, perverse that it does not partake in the formulation of the laws. So I don't apologize. There's nothing deep here. I'm not being deep at all. But there were people who invoked the principle of beauty. So this is the principle of non-perversity if you want. Um, if there is a preferred frame, this doesn't need to be true, but it can be true, and there is some kind of logical thing. If the frame is there, why not use it to formulate the laws of physics as well? And if you, and if you, and if you use that frame, you're going back to Newtonian physics. Now, this is testable, by the way, particularly because what you're saying is that the laws of physics only look the way they look in one frame, and if you shift yourself to another frame, they are different. Well, in fact, every six months, we're not in the preferred frame, and every six months, our speed changes. So you'd expect a change in the laws of physics every six months on Earth. So be very careful with these kind of things. If you play these games, you may contradict the experiment immediately. So the problem is, once you avoid these pathologies, may a culpin, what actually happens is, typically, you avoid the pathologies, you also put all the experimental consequences back in the beginning of the universe. So you're back to square zero, if you want. Hello, how are you? <laughs> okay, third point. Well, if this is true, then you can do the following. So once this is true, you can in include explicit time variability in the laws of physics. So this is the point where you don't need to phrase this in terms of varying speed of light, but you can if you want. And what you're saying is that my four is a very specific three plus one. Okay, I have this foliation of space-time into leaves, 
And what I can do is write a Lagrangian if I want, which is time dependent, or a Hamiltonian, which is time dependent. The easiest way to do this actually is to write the equations, the Einstein equations in this frame, and replace the C by a C of T. Immediately you screw up everything, you bugger it all up. Okay? You're guaranteed to do that. You have evolution in physics immediately. So this is essentially what I'm doing, okay? Uh, this is far from frivolous. So there's this question, meta law, do I have a meta law? Okay, there are laws evolving in time. Could this just be simply be encoded in a meta law? Well, the answer is no. This is far from frivolous because what you're saying is that time exists because the laws change. And what you're saying very, very concretely is that it's not only the case that the matter content of the universe is changing because of the cosmological expansion, but the Friedman equations are exchanging as well in time. The Lagrangian is a time dependence. So you're making a statement which is very, very concrete. There is time, and time is fundamental, because the laws of physics themselves change in time, and this immediately pegs down the existence of time and make, that makes it fundamental. It's far from frivolous as well because of Noether's theorem, so remember, that the symmetries of nature are associated with conserved quantities. If you violate any of these things, there is a conserved quantity which goes out of the window, it appears. And the time translational invariants of the laws are related to something which is nothing but energy conservation. So what you're saying is, well, then there is no energy conservation in the early universe if this is true. And so what? I want to create the universe at the Big Bang. Okay, the Big Bang, has, the matter in the universe has to come from somewhere. Well, violations of energy conservation, that's the obvious point, right? So don't be too shocked by the fact I'm not going to be producing matter or, or taking away matter now. But all this matter has to have come from somewhere. Okay, so in this way we're actually plugging together the variability of the laws of physics with energy violations, energy conservation violations, and the, the fact that we're here, that the universe exists, appears. So very concretely, you can actually do this game. I won't do it in detail. Another thing we were asked is not provide details. But if you play the usual game of using the Bianchi identities to find conservation of energy, you find that you have a non-conservation. And this non-conservation has a lot of stuff that contains the curvature of the universe times c dot over c. So if you have, for example, a closed universe, which therefore is supercritical, then this guy would be basically this year. So you solve the flatness problem. I was going to say I was going to be aristocratic for 20 minutes and solve these problems, which I don't think are problems. I don't think they're problems. But I know, they can't solve them. Um, you solve the flatness problem, but in addition, you actually link the existence of matter in the universe with this issue of time variability of constants, of laws, and therefore this issue of energy conservation. So let me just finish. I don't know if I have more time, but I'm just going to say one, one more thing. This is clearly very naive, but this is not meant to be serious. It's meant to just be provocative. It may be naive, but it's certainly better than a bloody scalar field with Einstein equations like inflation. Okay? You will never learn anything about quantum gravity, about time, about the universe with something that simplistic. And I do think it's really bad that people, for example, in quantum gravity, realizing they can't solve the problems directly, try to plug the, their thing into inflation, which is clearly something designed to avoid contact with quantum gravity. Okay? So I think this, is, this might be very naive, but it certainly is no less naive than inflation, and it at least encapsulates a bunch of issues which are very likely to be effectively things that come out of quantum gravity, namely the fact that the symmetries we see are really broken in the early universe. They're not things which uh, are fundamental, but they are things which emerge approximately at late times. And I think that's all I have to say. So that's the end of the talk. So we've not got a firm commitment by him to uh, go with Newtonian physics. We've got it all presented here as speculation and being provocative. He's not put in a firm commitment that he is believing what he's saying. But that's basically what it is. You accept the existence of a preferred frame. You can then get us back to Newtonian physics. And then modern physics has then spent 100 plus years on craziness from Einstein. Einstein's craziness. And then 
when that was pointed out, they just laughed. The audience laughed. And they wanted to go on to a diversion of, let's consider the structure of space-time. Well, if you're back to Newtonian physics, you are considering the structure of space-time then from a different context, aren't you? And the hundred years you've been doing it, it's been a messed up way of doing that as well. Thank you.